Uh, just as a reminder, you're in the big tr uh, picture track, and our next talk is titled Defense Defenseless in Depth. It's presented by Ryan Smith, who is the chief uh, science uh, um, researcher, chief research scientist at AccuVent Labs. That's correct, chief research scientist. Yes, please welcome Ryan. Thanks for coming, everyone. It's a big room, so I think they had uh, higher expectations than I can fulfill, but hopefully we'll have a good time. So my presentation is entitled Defenseless in Depth. Uh, and as I was introduced before, I'm the chief research scientist for AccuVant Labs. Uh, and my Twitter is at Hustle Labs. I need more followers. So with this presentation, what I'm hoping that everybody here can take home is a little bit of insight into the research process, or at least how we do it at AccuVant Labs. Um, sort of the view from an attacker's perspective, because a lot, of, a lot of the people in the audience, I'm assuming, spend their days uh, trying to secure a network. Can you raise your hands if your job is to secure a network? Come on. There we go, yeah. So when we're securing a network, sometimes we fail to take into account how an attacker might view the things we're using to secure that network. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll have a few questions for you, uh, that you can ask your security vendor to make them a little bit nervous. So uh, that might be fun. Maybe you could get a free lunch out of it or something. So uh, I wanted to do a little bit of a warm up. It is after lunch and all that. Uh, so when I came to Las Vegas, I bought and packed this hand espresso machine because I thought I would need coffee on demand in my room at any time, right? So I was a little bit nervous about presenting yesterday and a gentleman told me, don't drink any coffee the day you present. And uh, it was a good thing he didn't say espresso, because otherwise I wouldn't be here today. So uh, we have kind of an overarching thesis in this presentation. Originally, I was going to give it with a colleague of mine, Alex Wheeler, but he couldn't make it. So I'm going to use the term we a lot. And that just means him and myself. Um, so given that defense and depth strategies uh, can be implemented with security products, do we all accept that? Is that true? Yeah? Nod heads? Wave hands? Yeah, there we go. So, and that security products have lots of lines of code. Is that good? Are we good with that? Okay, cool. So, each line of code that processes attacker data is another opportunity for an attacker. Basically, anything where it could potentially go wrong and parse something incorrectly or anything else is an extra opportunity for an attacker to break into that system. So the overarching thesis is the defense and depth strategy actually presents lots of opportunities for attackers. We're trying to sort of corner hole them into not being able to exploit our networks. But at the same time, by adding those additional lines of code, we're giving them more opportunities. Oh, and there was a little cool zooming thing that I forgot to do. So uh, as a little bit of insight into the, into the research process that we had, um, sometimes research results are unexpected. Sometimes you go in there saying, this is what I'm going to research, and this is the end goal. Um, that was not the case with this. Um, basically, uh, we got together and we said, hey, auditing security products might be fun. Let's take a look at those and see uh, if we can find some vulnerabilities in those. And then we started to see some patterns coming across. These security products have vulnerabilities in it, something that uh, we didn't necessarily expect going off. I mean, we were pretty uh, confident, but it was nice to see that there were some vulnerabilities, so we were somewhat successful. So then we drew some conclusions from those patterns um, and took those conclusions, and we made a black hat speech. So uh, one thing that I will remember next time, the most important thing about the Black Hat speech is that you finish in time. Didn't work out so well, but we got everything going and uh, everything worked out. So uh, basically defense in depth is this thing that came from the military originally. It's something that came from another realm that we're applying to uh, computer science principles. So the military take, and the military idea of defense in depth is to have a small number of heavily fortified soldiers in fortresses, basically, 
surrounding a country in order to protect the country and have a large number of mobile troops that can come and back them up if anybody were to attack the country. Uh, does anybody know how that directly applies to computer science? I mean, uh, basically the only example I could think of is honeypots are kind of like that, where uh, honeypots are this sort of territory that, uh, that people can break into somewhat easier, and then the rest of the defenses can come. But that's not actually what we use honeypots for. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that uh, this defense in depth term actually caught on. Uh, basically, defense in depth is kind of a term that people use to say, we're putting security everywhere we can possibly think of putting security. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah, so basically it's an excuse to get another antivirus. I mean, it's not necessarily a bad strategy, but you have to remember this entire presentation is coming from an attacker's perspective. The result of applying these defenses at every point possible is that attackers can interact with more and more lines of code. If you guys remember when Service Pack 2 came out with XP, one of the main security things they did there was to reduce the amount of code and reduce the attack surface. By, but by putting these products out there that are processing attacker code, uh, antivirus, IDS, all of those things are purpose built to process attacker code. So we're actually creating a better opportunity for an attacker. And here's, a, here's an example of uh, the different things that I've heard with Defense in Depth. Basically deploying, and so also, I, I failed to mention this, but this presentation is going to focus mainly on antivirus. And the reason we did that was to keep it sort of short and concise. But so with antivirus and defense in depth, um, basically email gateways, traffic gateways, workstations, servers, all have antivirus deployed on them in a potential defense in depth setup and also uh, different antivirus engines. Maybe we'll use McAfee at one layer, maybe we'll use Bitdefender at another. And so the attacker's translation when the attacker hears this is that you're gonna deploy potentially vulnerable code where email is stored and processed, where traffic has to flow through, uh, potentially every machine on your network. And uh, basically, not only are we going to deploy it in quantity, but we're also going to deploy a variety of it. So the only thing that's not antivirus that I have in this presentation is the trusted platform module. Um, who here uh, has a trusted platform module that they know about on their systems? Who here has an IBM ThinkPad? A few more. So basically every IBM ThinkPad comes with a trusted platform module and it's enabled by default. Um, I like to call it the trusting platform module and we'll get into that a little bit more but uh, uh, that's my favorite term. Some people thought of treacherous and stuff like that but I'm just not that creative and it was a few too many syllables for me. So the motivations behind TPM, uh, boot time encryption. Do we use boot time encryption? Some of us. So basically you can secure that boot time encryption by having it so that the boot is actually secure uh, basically up until where you enter your password so that no program can look at the password as you're typing it in, such as key loggers and malware. Um, so that's basically what it's used for now. Eventually, uh, the idea is that it will also enable companies to do DRM things, to make sure that we can't copy music, uh, basically to make sure that you can't inspect programs. Um, the other thing is it will complicate a lot of security work in the future. Um, if DRM is implemented, that also means that we won't be able to attach debuggers to processes anymore and all of the other things that uh, the companies don't think we should do. This is a little bit uh, sort of conspiracy theory, but it's interesting. Um, so the way it started, it's sort of like a slow play in poker. Um, basically, it was a scary specification at first, but that didn't attract much attention. So then, when that uh, scariness died down, they started building it into every ThinkPad laptop. As soon as it wasn't on the tip of everyone's tongue when they were talking about the next violation of uh, user rights. So, after they did that, they allowed the operation that everybody wants, boot time encryption, making sure that malware can't look at that password. That's awesome. That's something everybody wants. Uh, in the future, uh, I believe that they're going to implement DRM and all the other stuff preventing fair use and eventually unleash the robot plague. That last part was a joke. I know it's after lunch, but you gotta wake up. <clears throat> so uh, a little bit about the TPM boot process. So 
as soon as a computer goes on, it enters the reset state. And that's a very uh, defined state. You can look through the Intel documentation. And basically, it starts executing at 0000, 0, 0, 0 FFFF uh, as soon as the computer boots up. Um, and that loads the BIOS uh, boot block, is what it's called. And that basically just initializes the system to a sane state so that the rest of the BIOS code can run without having to do too many crazy things. Um, the boot block also checks the signatures on secondary stages. Basically, it's kind of like having several executables inside one BIOS chip is how it's built today. <clears throat> so, also the boot block will perform an update of the, blo of the boot block itself if there's an update present. Because if you look at the next step, write gets the ability to write to the chip gets disabled as soon as the boot block leaves and goes into the main code. So you can't write that area of the BIOS. And uh, after that, the secondary BIOS code is executed. So basically, it's a pretty secure certificate chain going forward. As long as the boot block is secure, the idea is that everything else is secure. Uh, so the boot block can't be updated. RSA signatures are hard to forge. They tend to use RSA signatures to be able to authenticate the rest of the boot block. And uh, basically, everything has a whole lot of uh, complex modular arithmetic applied to it. So I guess the, the thing that actually um, makes this secure is that uh, faking, uh, forging an RSA signature is somewhat difficult. Uh, the reason that, and the way it works is uh, a hash value is generated of the specific piece of code to be authenticated. They pad the hash value, and then they compute it's hash value to the third power mod private key, and that's the public signature, basically, for the code. So they take that signature value afterwards, and they'll compute the hash value to the third mod the public key in order to get the data back that was signed. And basically, it's hard to do that without, uh, without being able to know a couple of things. The reason is prime factorization of those private and public keys is hard. We all know that. Um, and c without those uh, signature values, if a secure padding scheme is used inside that RSA signature, it's going to be incredibly hard to forge. So these are some things that make RSA signatures easy to forge. Or one thing in particular, actually, it's insecure padding. Uh, how many people know about uh, RSA signature padding? How many people have looked into that a bit? Audience participation, please. There we go. Just lie to me if you have to. <laughs> Thank you, John. So basically, if basically, along with all the RSA standards, they have a lot of standards about how to securely implement padding inside of an RSA signature. Um, and the reason that, uh, that they do that is because one value that's super easy to compute is the desired value, uh, the cube root of that, uh, and use that as a signature. Because if you remember back to the RSA, it basically takes whatever was signed and puts it to the third power, and that's the actual signature that comes out. And as long as that doesn't wrap around the modulus, which happens when insecure RSA padding, or uh, when secure RSA padding is used, it's ensured that it wraps around the modulus. But when it's not, that means it doesn't need to wrap around the modulus, and it's super easy to compute cube roots. Um, so basically, Let's talk a little bit about IBM's implementation of RSA inside the TPM. Uh, the subtitle is the wrong way, because you should never do this if you're implementing it. So basically, inside the BIOS, they have 10 24-bit RSA signatures. And inside that, they stuff 160-bit SHA-1 hash. Does anybody here read assembly code? OK, so I'll, t I'll talk people through this a bit. Thanks, guys. So basically, what this does is it takes the signature value after the RSA operations have taken place and takes the last 20 bytes, which is the size of a SHA-1 hash, and uses that to compare to the actual thing. So basically, the padding idea is that we're going to not look at the first 6C bytes of the RSA signature and only look at the last 20. So here's a signature taken from an IBM laptop. It's a huge number. 